There we go. All right. All right. Let's see here. Welcome to Keeping It Real, the largest podcast made by real estate agents and for real estate agents. My name is DJ Paris. I am your guide and host through the show. Today is our monthly series called Unpopular Real Estate Opinions with Chris Linsell. Now, Chris is a real estate technology analyst and director of content at Luxury Presence. He specializes in new solutions to old questions, constantly exploring the cutting edge of technology in the real estate space. Chris is also a worked sorry Chris also has many years of experience as a licensed realtor in the state of Michigan has worked as a marketer a digital strategist and a trainer for ma- major national brands like Berkshire Hathaway Home Services of Michigan and Coldwell Banker Schmidt Realtors Chris is currently again the director of content with Luxury Presence he's an accomplished musician actor and speaker, and Chris has engaged with audiences ranging from sizes uh, 30 to 3,000 and is often chosen to speak at the National Association of Realtors Conference, among many other regional conferences in the country. Chris, welcome once again to the show. DJ, it's a pleasure to be here with you and a pleasure to be having my second conversation in a row with you. Uh, Listeners, I'm going to hijack the intro here. DJ, uh, joined me for an interview where I got to chat him up and hear his opinions um, at a recent uh, meeting uh, for my team at Luxury Presence. And uh, I got to say, you're good at interviewing, but you're good at being interviewed too, man. Well, thank you. I was very uh, surprised and, and flattered to be able to speak to Luxury Presence uh, for at least a, a few minutes and be um, be a fly on the wall to see how the organization runs its meetings and could not have been more impressed with the leadership there. And boy, the employees sure love working there, which I think is is a, what, what a fun, uh, exciting thing. I, I left, I walked away from that meeting feeling energized and excited and just fun to be a part of it. And I come from that world. I come from the, the IT space. So it's a fun place to, uh, to revisit. Well, um, but th- thank you for, for the nice compliment. It was, it was a real honor for me to, to, of to, course. Show, to be there. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was great to have you there. I, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm biased. I love what we're doing at luxury presence. I think, um, everybody should check out, uh, what we're, what we're working on right now. Um, but one way or the other, it's great to uh, get together in any venue possible with you to talk about what's going on uh, in the real estate space. And there's a lot happening right now. I mean, it is like the hits just keep on coming, it feels like. There is. I'd love to start and just spend a few moments on this. I know we're probably all a little tired uh, of thinking about buyer compensation and the NAR lawsuit and what that's going to mean for for the near future for agents with respect to commissions. And But we'd be remiss if we didn't spend a minute or so on it. We've talked about this before. We will continue to talk about it. It's not going to be the main uh, focus of our conversation right now. But I read an interesting article on Inman. I think you might have seen it as well, where yesterday a, a professor from California, I forget where, uh, was speaking at a Minnesota real estate conference and said, I don't think 6% commissions are going away. And I was excited to read that. He was then, I think, followed by a journalist from CNN who had the exact opposite opinion. But I I just love the fact that these industry experts are debating and there isn't a clear consensus. So for me, the takeaway I got from reading those, those two reports was, uh, maybe we don't know what's going to, we don't know how it's going to impact actually an agent's income yet. Um, so some, obviously there's people on both sides, but the good news is not everyone's saying the same thing or the same thing if it's <laughs> commissions are, you know, fundamentally going to decrease. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's interesting. The piece that you're referencing um, was a, a piece written by a journalist at Inman named Jim Dalrymple, who I've got, I had the pleasure of, uh, meeting and knowing for a while with uh, as as uh, as I've gotten a chance to speak with uh, the Inman events and and get to know their folks there he's a really thoughtful guy um, and Dalrymple teased out a handful of um, 
insights in this article uh, around how specifically this point of view is likely to affect the different kind of levels within the real estate space. And I mean, the reality is if you are in a real estate market where, uh, where the majority of your clients and the majorities of the majority of the properties that are subject to either being purchased or um, uh, of, of being purchased or sold, if if you are in a market where six um, percent is certainly not you know a small amount of money, but it's not going to make or break uh, transactions necessarily. I I have to agree. I think that there is uh, a lot of evidence that would suggest. Uh, that the NAR lawsuit settlement uh, proposal um, is not going to uh, dramatically um, pressure that commission rate. But I will say, I, I also think that we want to make sure we don't suffer from a uh, like a cardinal sin of those of us who talk about real estate, which is we talk about real estate and the real estate industry in these big macro terms, forgetting that real estate is a micro industry. Yeah. I mean, it is almost a, a super micro industry. When you think about how, uh, even though it's interesting to hear stats and pundits talk about the industry at large, the industry in California and Texas and Oregon and Washington DC has little effect on the industries in Chicago or in Michigan or in Iowa or in uh, New Orleans. These are markets that really operate semi-autonomously from one another. And so making big, broad macro predictions is kind of like trying to predict the weather for the entire country all in one, all at one time. It might be helpful to understand the averages, but it's not going to do you a lot of good when you're trying to pick what to wear that day. Um uh, I think that's a I think that's a fair point. It's it's so micro. It's really, you know, neighborhood by neighborhood is almost yeah. its own market or block by block. And so uh, I totally agree. I I do think that we're as professionals hyper focused on this issue. I don't know that most consumers are even all that aware yet. They will become more aware as more news stories are are published and and more. TV, uh, you know, the 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 24 hour news networks are, are going to be covering it, I'm sure, uh, even more than they are already. But I I just don't think this is something that most consumers are I I think they know something's going on, but I'm not sure they know exactly what. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. And I think one of the challenges in this conversation, actually, is that uh despite how much we talk about the different kind of downstream effects of the NAR lawsuit, uh, proposed lawsuit settlement, um, the way that those effects will ultimately play out is going to be market dependent. I am very confident that uh, those, uh, the friends I have that are operating in high value, high pressure, extraordinarily competitive markets like New York and Los Angeles, even the Washington DC area, um, they the uh, the uh, strategies that they are already adopting in order to account for what they expect to see as market changes are going to be incredibly different um, than the strategies necessary for uh, agents in less competitive markets, agents in higher volume but lower price point markets, yeah. agents who service a large set of referral clients rather than working with their own clients directly. There is there are like a hundred different ways to slice this cake. And, but I, I do want to say though, um, and, and would love to put forth uh, a, a couple of suggestions, despite the fact that, you know, my basic message here is um, these big declarations are fun to listen to, but difficult to apply. There right. are a handful of universal things that, that professionals should be doing right now um, to, uh, adequately prepare their business for the shift. 
Um, and that's the first, the first thing is actually just to acknowledge the fact that a shift is coming, that there is going to be um, a shift in the way that the real estate industry is perceived by the public. There's going to be a way, a, a shift in the requirements for uh, contracts and for negotiation at every level. This is all pending the lawsuit approval, uh, uh, which you know is maybe another conversation. But assuming that it is the set the settlement is approved, there are going to be universal things that need to be done. We are going to have to universally. Doesn't matter which level of the business uh, you operate in. Universally, you are going to have to understand how a de facto guaranteed uh, paycheck as a buyer's agent, how that the fact that that no longer exists is going to affect your cost of um, doing business. What is the margin on your transactions moving forward? Can you spend the same amount on leads is a great question. I hear a lot of people asking. If I if it used to be that I um, could pretty much guarantee myself a, a ten thousand dollar commission check, uh, from a lead from Zillow, um, could, that would justify spending $1,000 on a closed lead from Zillow. If I can't guarantee that any longer, can I justify that that purchase price for that closed lead? Is that Does it adjust my business plan? These are all conversations that we should be having internally with ourselves and with our team right now. You know the the things the changes that I'm going to be making in my business and in the businesses that I advise, uh, and the changes that listeners are going to make are, are likely not going to be the same. We can certainly learn from each other, uh, but you know, don't hear a message of big macro. Um, you know, messages are difficult to apply. Don't decode that as I don't have anything to do. It just means you got to figure out specifically what you need to do. I can't tell you exactly what that is unless you know I'm shoulder to shoulder with you. Yeah, I will say one thing that most agents would probably benefit from now having some time to prepare before the settlement, you know, supposedly uh, may go into effect this summer is to perfect your buyer professional service fee conversation. And mm -hmm. now is the time to practice it. Talk to your managing broker, get some training there. I'm seeing CE schools uh, coming out with new programs now to really account for the shift in potentially in, in buyer compensation mm -hmm. and creating programs and accreditations to really learn this. So even if you're not learning it at your firm, there are reach out to your CE company, reach out to lenders. They're starting to offer these uh, these educational platforms as well, mm -hmm. so that you can really be up to speed on what to do when you you know do work with a buyer in the future. So I'd say yeah. at the very least start working on having that that conversation because you're going to start having it a lot if you work with buyers. Totally. And you know the the kind of the last note I would say on this is I would encourage folks not to fall into a trap of uh what I would say uh is false preparation or false confidence. I'll give you a good example of this. And let me just start by saying I'm not trying to throw any shade here, not trying to ruffle any feathers, though I probably will. Um, I cannot tell you how many Instagram posts I have seen from realtors over the last three weeks of them doing a selfie in their ABR, which is the accredited buyer's representative um, in uh, designation classes. Like, I'm getting geared up to represent my buyers. Um, you know, I've got, I'm taking this class. I'm going to have ABR after my name. Listen, I'm not saying that ABR is worthless. Not, I, I frankly, I don't know. I've never sat in a class. I don't really know the value that it provides. But if you think that having ABR at the end of your name <laughs> is going to uh, shortcut your conversation about your value to your buyers, uh, you are sorely mistaken. You have, yeah. um, you're setting yourself up for failure and wasting your time in the class. So, um, you know, I, there's a lot that can be learned from any kind of designation opportunity within real estate. Some of them are better than others, but the mo the biggest value you can get from these sorts of classes is the actual content. If it actually helps you prepare your business, phenomenal. Then you are doing the right thing and you're sitting in the right place. But if you think for a second that um, clients are going to uh, balk at your 3% um, uh, fee requirement 
and then you show them your ABR uh, on your business card, and they'll magically just fall all over themselves trying to get the pen and sign on the dotted line. Man, I, I got some swamp land to sell you uh, <laughs> if you think that that's going to happen. One, one quick thing about the ABR designation. I, yeah, I don't think it's something to brag about for, for a couple of reasons. And I'm when I say brag, you know, the social media posts. One, I, I don't think if I was working <laughs> – with uh, if I had worked with a realtor in the past and they'd help me buy a home, and then I see that now they're getting their accredited buyer representation, I might feel like, oh, they didn't have that when they worked with me. I don't know. I might feel a, a certain way about that that may not be super positive. Also, I just don't think the public cares about your the that that you know that that ABR unless you're able to effectively explain in that social media post all the cool stuff you're learning. And I just think most of your audience isn't going to care about that, but. The ABR is a really great uh, designation, not to to show to the world, but just to learn. And mm -hmm. I believe that NAR, I think, is offering it for free, or maybe your local associations are offering it for free right now. So, and I know they've updated it to account for some of these changes. So there's probably really good stuff there. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's something that you hang it at the end of your name and all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm, I'm an ABR, so we can just shortcut the conversation. No, you're, it's going to teach you how to have the conversation. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And, and anyway, but outside of that, what else is going on in the real estate world that maybe we're not paying as close attention to mm -hmm. because we're focused so much on how am I going to get paid going forward? Well, you know, there's a couple of things that I think are really fascinating. These, these kind of stories that exist um, that uh, are maybe not getting the same kind of attention that they deserve. Um, one of them is a recent uh, a recent study, and I'm, I'm blanking on where I have this data. I'm, I'm going to find it. I promise. Um, that is uh, is basically it's a statistical accounting of the fact that uh, baby boomers have been hanging on to their uh, family homes longer and longer and longer such that many of them are skipping the downsizing and retirement uh, home stage of home ownership and the big driver of this is that especially in the last you know couple of years here interest rates have been so volatile that as it stands right now even if they have a mortgage on their family home um, to sell that home to buy something smaller, maybe less expensive, might result in a higher mortgage payment because interest rates are so dramatically high relative to where a lot of these folks refinanced during the like the 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 valleys of COVID when it was sub three, um, sub three percent, and you know a lot of those folks qualify just by virtue of um, the stage they are in their wealth building. Um, for the absolute best interest rates out there. I mean, a lot of baby boomers uh, that are my parents' generation right now have interest rates they refinanced at like 2.5%. Two, I mean, it's, they're, they're, it's like they're buying a bicycle, not a house. I mean, it's insanely low. And so a lot of these folks have been hanging on to their properties for longer and longer and longer. And one of the downstream effects of that is obviously less inventory. Well, these uh, these home buyers, or excuse me, these home sellers are are starting, the, it, we're starting to see them age out of home ownership. And there is now a study that predicts that in the next 10 years, over oh, oh, nearly nine and a quarter million households owned by baby boomers are going to be selling because they're aging out of home ownership. This means that there is going to be an incredible um, uh, uptick in uh, inventory, especially in markets where people go to retire. And the best part about this inventory is that it hasn't seen the market in 20 or 30 years. These are folks who have owned their homes statistically for a long time. So it is not like it is inventory that has cycled on and off. It's brand new. It's unlikely to even be in the MLS at this point. It is going to cause a lot of activity in markets where people retire. And I frankly am, am one, you know, there's CNBC is calling this the silver tsunami um, of, of home inventory. I'm not totally sure I buy how dramatic that is. 
Uh, but I do think the tide is going to start rising, in, especially in these retirement markets. I think the inventory pinch um, is, is starting to lessen. We might even see an inventory surplus in the next year or two. Yeah, I had a couple of thoughts as you were going through that uh, that sort of idea of baby boomers retiring. You know, right now it's uh, middle of April. We are seeing currently interest rates at the highest they've been for the year, and we're due to inflation and the economy. We're now seeing the Fed possibly signaling that they're not looking to decrease rates in the immediate, immediate future. You know, uh, immediate being you know the next few months kind of kind of situation. So that may or may not happen. Of course, that's a that's that's a guess. But we are to your first point about uh, baby boomers having you know. Let's be honest; they refinanced when rates were low in most mm-hmm. cases, and now they either have fully paid off their home or they still have a mortgage, but they're paying, you know, two and a half, three percent, four percent at most. And going to seven and a half percent in retirement, yes, uh, it doesn't feel good. And mm-hmm. it's it's not something that um they you know, homeowners know what that what they're paying in their mortgage. They they know that amount and they're gonna be in for some sticker shock. And so as a result, you're right, they're they're sitting on the sidelines because they just want to wait for a better, a better interest rate. Now, or you know, the inventory is not quite there to buy. Um, mm-hmm. However, what I was thinking about is as a real estate agent, what they could do to start preparing for eventually this huge surplus of, of listings that's going to be happening is really thinking about how can I capture more of that market share in the next decade. And I think there's some partnerships, some strategic partnerships mm-hmm. you can build. A yeah. um, couple of industries come to mind, uh, real estate, sorry, um, uh, um, estate planning, rather mm-hmm. estate planning attorneys. I was going to say real estate attorneys. Those are always good to uh, have relationships with. But estate planning attorneys. Those are the people that do wills and, and trusts and and really do uh, wealth transfer and, and succession planning and you know sort of just maintaining the wealth that's been built up in that family over the years, which includes, of course, uh, real property, which would be. Um, you know, of course, uh, home ownership. So this is an opportunity to, you know, build relationships with financial advisors, accountants, anyone who is going to be assisting the baby boomers in their late, the last stages of their life uh, with respect to their economic um, life and, mm-hmm. and health. So those are, these are a good time to really build those connections and relationships so that when interest rates do come down or hopefully come down, and we start to see some of those some of those seniors think about it's time to downsize and move and now rates are at an attractive level you want to be the person of course that they that they reach out to um the other thing i was thinking about with respect to uh to what you were saying is that there's a lot of inventory that you know look my parents have been in their home since 1980 they have not downsized yet and mm-hmm. eventually they will and guess what that home i don't know if it was ever on the mls or not it was it was mm-hmm. a new build at the time so it, it's likely i don't know if it would have gone on there back in 1980 or not but regardless uh you know my parents home they they've they've made a lot of upgrades but a lot of homes who have been on you know been lived in by one family for that long have not so yeah. i think it's also a good opportunity to start thinking about when these homes do come on the market there's going to be uh, you know for example younger people who come in and say oh i don't like these finishes i don't like the flooring i don't mm-hmm. like the appliances these are this is old and outdated and really starting to think about how am i going to have conversations with sort of the uh, Instagram crowd who sees Mm -hmm. everything is perfect. Right. And, you know, and, and everything's going to look perfect. Well, when you walk in and you see, you know, an old tube television or, you know, bright, uh, you know, bright pink uh, wallpaper or something that Mm -hmm. maybe isn't as aesthetically in vogue right now, how are you going to have those conversations? So maybe it's a great time to, you know, work on building your team up of interior designers, renovators, uh, construction, people that know how to how to take an older property and really modify it so that when you walk through, you're like, don't worry, I have a team that can fix this, 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 and this. Mm-hmm. I think that's a huge opportunity. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. Hey, I wanted to um, bring up one other story that kind of plays in my uh, my my tech uh, world that I think is really interesting. Um, there was an article in the New York Times uh, last week uh, that talked about 
how um, some of these large language models, some of these big AI companies are starting to run out of uh, data that they can feed to train these models. You know, yeah. these, these um, if, you've, if you've heard me at a conference in the last year, I do a fair amount of talking about how LLMs, these large language models work. And in a nutshell, feed it data uh, such that it can learn the objective data and answer it, uh, answer objective questions. And it learns the context of all the other data such that it can answer subjective questions and make predictions. Well, we're starting to run out of data to feed and train these models. And so we're starting to turn to these secondary sources of data. Uh, Google, for instance, is um, beginning to feed Gemini um, some, uh, which is their, uh, their uh, AI model. It's beginning to feed it uh, Google My Business profiles and Google reviews. And so... Though this is just speculation, I am I'm uh, working on a piece right now um, about how it, it I, I see a world not too long from now where um, you know where once we were really concerned about SEO and about our websites showing up in search traffic and in search results, I can see a world where we are optimizing our online presence such that we are showing up in AI results as well. So. Uh, it is it's, it's something to be thinking about if you've been holding off or ignoring, uh, especially your Google presence. That might be uh, might be something to re revisit right now. Yeah, the action step I hear there is make sure you have a Google My Business profile. More importantly, make sure you're asking for reviews from your clients, yeah. not just on Zillow, Zillow too, Zillow and Google My Business uh, and, and possibly Facebook, I would say, as, as a third option. But but I think Google My Business may, in fact, if you were to choose just one place to get reviews, as much as we all love Zillow as far as their ability to 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 get reviews and and have as a resource for agent, for people to look up your reviews, I think Google My Business will eventually be the the default source. Um, we've saw we've seen Google take that over from Yelp and essentially decimated Yelp's position in the marketplace as the review. I mean, they're still around, but they are not what they were. And so this is a great time to not only have a Google My Business account, get reviews, but also post regular content. So mm -hmm. Google My Business is kind of a micro blogging site. So you can actually write content on there or post images, videos. This is a time. So if you're posting on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, dump those same videos and content right into Google My Business. Google loves that. They and again, you know, Google My Business is hyper local. So th this is, you know, this is different from TikTok, Instagram, and, and Facebook. So you want this, they're gonna serve this up to local members of your community more likely um, mm -hmm. than than other platforms. So totally agree there. Um, yeah. And you know, kind of on that final note, and, and granted, I, I know, again I realize I'm a little biased here, but it's worth saying. Um, this the 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 other thing that this points out to me um, is not only is Google uh, cementing and probably raising the stakes in terms of their importance in the way that real estate professionals are found, but it also is an is just a bright yellow highlighter over the fact that. Um, real estate professionals have a shrinking number of ways that they can reach their audience that doesn't require a filter um, of somebody else, somebody else running, you know, requiring the traffic to pass through a toll booth in order to get there, whether it's Google, whether it's uh, Meta, uh, whether it is uh, TikTok, there are, there are algorithms and um, other businesses who ultimately control whether or not people see the things that you create on those platforms, the only way now it, that you can really have a non-filtered, non-toll booth experience with your traffic is to get them to visit you directly online uh, and your website, I mean, your website is the, is the place for this now. So if you have not invested in a in a website, it is not a digital business card any longer. Those days are gone. This is the only place that you have to provide an unfiltered, uncurated experience to your traffic uh, that doesn't depend on an algorithm. Um, so if you're if you're certainly be investing in time and space in places like Google My Business Profile, this is. An incredibly important message, and I'm not trying to downplay, but I am also trying to say uh, that there is 
uh, no other way for you to give your traffic um, a completely uh, genuine and authentic experience for your brand and your business and your value other than getting them to visit your website or to literally sit across the table with you. It's hard to sit across the table with a thousand people a day. It's easy to have them sit across the digital table at your website. Yeah, two two quick things on that topic. The Number one, I think it's important that everybody, at least this is an assumption I would encourage you to to adopt, that no matter who the client, however the client gets to you, referral, cold call, uh, however, they're going to, best friend, they're going to still Google you. And and mm-hmm. when they Google you, you want them to find your website because your website is the only place where you can fully control that narrative. And as Chris's point, this is really where you get to tell your story. Yeah. And yes, um, you know, there's certain things on there that you, we could debate about whether do we need a home search on our website? Do we, I, okay, that's, that's debatable. But one thing that people do want to know is about you and, and you get to tell your story there. And there's so many great providers now that can build really, uh, really nice looking and, and functional and with a good user experience websites for inexpensive pricing. But just remember, people are going to Google you. And yes, they may find your Google My Business and may read your reviews. They're also going to look for your website. And this yeah. is where you get to say, here's who I am and here's what I'm all about. Um, and I think it can really help, you know, close those deals. Um, totally agree. And, and I just wanted to make one point about AI. I was talking about training language models. I know that I think Reddit inked a deal with ChatGBT. I could mm-hmm. be wrong about this, but I know Reddit has inked a deal with one of the uh, one of the the uh, the AI engines to train on Reddit data. And I just thought for any of us that use Reddit, that seems very scary to me because a lot of Reddit conversation is is not always um, what I would consider to be normal discourse uh, in polite <laughs> society. But um, I'm curious to see what 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 it's going to learn from some of these uh, some of these Reddit comments. Agreed. Yeah, that will be very interesting. I think if you zoom out uh, at Reddit, uh, it, it gets more uh, acceptable. But yeah, if you zoom in on you zoom in, <laughs> you can get, you can get bring lost some sunglasses. Some dark corners. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, I love Reddit. I'm a daily Reddit user myself, but I, yeah, I do, I do just, just in the way people communicate on Reddit, whether it's positive or negative, it, it isn't always complete sentences. It isn't always. So I'll be very curious to see what, what is done with this data. But anyway, um, great place to wrap up for today. And Chris, uh, as always on behalf of the audience, thank you for coming on once again, you've been with us for years and years and provide such a fresh and unique and informed voice for what's going on in the real estate industry. Our, our audience loves it and they appreciate you. So on behalf of them, thanks. On behalf of Chris and myself, also thanks to everyone listening right now. Look, we wouldn't continue to be able to do these shows if you didn't tune in. So we work for you. We appreciate you. Let us know what we can do to improve. If there's certain topics you'd like Chris and I to to discuss, we can prepare for that. And we'd love to. So please let us know. You can you know email the show or write us a note somewhere in social media. We're easy to find. Uh, Chris, you can also find on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, we'll have links to his account. And he's also on Facebook. Of course, he's everywhere. But um, feel free to reach out to Chris. And he loves uh, you know having conversations in sort of you know, thorough and, and extensive conversations about these topics as they affect your business. So please reach out to him. ChrisLinsell.com is where you can go to learn all about Chris and what he uh, what he offers because he speaks at many, many conferences, including National Association of Realtor Conferences, uh, every every year as well as regional conferences, Inman, various uh, ones that, that you may attend. Chris is likely to show up there. But if you would like him to show up at a conference or speak to your brokerage or you know, any sort of industry event, um, definitely reach out to him. And uh, Chris, do you have any exciting speaking engagements coming up in the next month or two? I'm going to be uh, at Iman Connect in Miami Beach uh, in May. So uh, come find me. I'll be the guy with the Hawaiian shirt and the sunglasses on. Um, and uh, let's see here. Uh, a handful of other things, uh, including uh, an uh, amazing uh, opportunity to address the uh, group um, of uh, Alberta realtors in Edmonton this fall that I'm super excited about. Uh, and I guess I'll also use this time to give a special shout out to my friends at the Minneapolis Realtors Association. I got the uh, opportunity to um, speak at their event uh, last month, or excuse me, last week, 
uh, and it was just really uh, a fantastic time to connect with uh, with some awesome professionals. So you know, um, and I'm yeah, I'm embarrassed because I, I had said earlier that I was referencing and in. in um, a professor that or that went. To, I think it was at that conference that that person. No, it was a different. It was a different one. one. I think that conference was happening at um, uh, Minnesota at the University of Minnesota. Oh, actually. that's funny. Two um, different Minnesota conferences. But I yeah. So anyway, uh, long story short, people in Minnesota, you're getting a lot of good real estate conference uh, co- content right now. So good on you. I uh, love Minneapolis, one of my favorite places. Mall of America, can't go wrong. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, if if uh, if you want to connect, um, I'd love to chat. Um, and thanks, special thanks to uh, to those who have reached out. I've, I had a chance to connect with some amazing listeners from this show. Um, like DJ said, I love having conversations with folks. Um, I love arguing with folks over uh, common uh, common good items that we can use to build each other and our business uh, better. And uh, would love to be a part of delivering value to your membership if you're looking for a speaker or for uh, some provocative conversation around the topics that are governing the real estate business right now. ChrisLinsell.com is where you can reach out to Chris and have those conversations or see what his availability is to come speak at one of your events. Um, again, thanks to everyone for staying, sticking around to the end. Please tell a friend about this uh, podcast. Please tell a friend about this episode. Um, this, I think, is particularly an important one for agents to think about what's going on right now. So please feel free to share this with them and leave us a review. Hit the like and subscribe button as well. We appreciate it. And we will see everybody on the next episode. Thanks, Chris.